In this section, we're going to have a look at some of the fundamental building blocks for fairness and responsible AI. And we're going to start with a definition for responsible AI from the OSCD that states, AI that is innovative and trustworthy and that respects human rights and democratic values. So obviously there are quite a few loaded terms in that definition. So we're actually going to break this down into different dimensions of responsible AI. And fairness is going to be one of several dimensions. So what are the different dimensions? And we also have some example metrics to illustrate them in a bit more detail. The first dimension of responsible AI, and this is related to the trustworthiness aspect that we had in the definition, is all about privacy and security. So this is talking about, is the data used in accordance with privacy and legal considerations? And is it also protected from theft and exposure? So basically, do the right people have access to the data and do we prevent it from getting shared more widely than is necessary or legal to do? The second pillar that we have is fairness, where we're going to look at are there any harmful disparities in the system behavior across different subpopulations? So obviously there are, again, quite a few terms in there. We're going to have a look at what we mean by harmful disparities, and then we'll have a look at what the different measures are that we can use to actually quantify those disparities in behavior. The third dimension that we have is explainability, where we ask the question, does the system offer a clear rationale for its decision? Moving on, the fourth dimension is robustness. So how hard is it to confuse or fool the system? So if you think about a machine learning system, there are many components to it, and usually the end user only gets the model prediction. And there have been incidents and cases where actually users were able to fool the system, and this is a so-called adversarial attack. So is it possible to fool the system with these adversarial examples? That is what we're going to talk about in a little bit when we cover robustness of machine learning systems. And then the penultimate dimension on the list is transparency, which is all about enabling the users to make informed choices about the use of the system. So is it really clear if you're interacting with an AI-based system with a machine learning model? And do you have the information that you need to really make a choice on what is going on, how to use it, and how to proceed. The final dimension that we have is governance. And this is about enforcing and ensuring that the responsible AI practices are being carried out amongst all stakeholders. So there are many people involved usually in building a machine learning solution. It starts from data engineers, the model, or problem formulation that could even come from business experts or somebody else in the organization, all the way down to the data scientist who actually builds a model and then potentially somebody else who actually goes and deploys the model and monitors its performance over time once it's deployed and obviously the final user of the model itself as well. So there are many different people involved and many different components that make up the ML system and we need to ensure that the best practices are upheld at each and every stage. As we'll see later on in a bit more detail, there are certain trade-offs in responsible AI that we need to consider. So first of all, in machine learning, we usually have a primary objective of building a model that performs well. And when we say that models should perform well, we usually talk about the error being minimal or the accuracy being as high as possible. And this would be what we call the primary objective. So we want the model to work well. But then on the other hand, now we have all of these different dimensions, like how explainable is the model going to be? What are the fairness constraints that we need to put in place? So these are going to be our secondary objectives. And unfortunately, these can actually be at odds with one another. So first of all, we can have issues and trade-offs between the primary and the secondary objectives. And then furthermore, we can actually have trade-offs or we can observe trade-offs between maximizing the secondary objectives themselves. So it is going to be challenging to maximize all dimensions of responsible AI simultaneously. And we have a couple of examples here on this slide. So for example, if you were to preserve privacy by making the data more coarse, by creating buckets of data points, well, then that will make it harder to explain 
a particular data point because now you've made it more coarse. So you can find examples for all of these different trade-offs and we're going to have a look at some of them in more detail later on as well. For the rest of the course, we're going to focus on the second dimension, which is the fairness dimension. And like I said, this is going to be about defining how to quantify and measure these harmful disparities in the system behavior and performance on, again, different subpopulations. So the context of this course is going to be usually data that concerns humans. Obviously, you can extend these techniques to any kind of data but we will look at it in the context of having different subpopulations present in the data set. On the previous slide, we had a look at the different dimensions of responsible AI. And one of the dimensions that we looked at was fairness with the question of are there any harmful disparities in system performance or behavior between different subpopulations? And we're going to rephrase this slide now where we're going to start calling these harmful disparities unwanted bias. We have to be a little bit careful though because bias is actually a term that's quite commonly used in machine learning and also in a social context. So on this slide here, we have a distinction between the different meanings of bias in the respective domains. First example is for model evaluation, where bias refers to the unexplained error stemming from model selection and assumptions that we make about the model and the data itself. The second use of the word bias is in neural networks in machine learning, where bias is a value that helps control the quality of fit during the training of the neural network. In a social context, we refer to bias as systematic differences with respect to different subpopulations. And finally, coming to the meaning in responsible AI, it's the harmful disparities in system behavior or performance on subpopulations. And subpopulations here are groups with shared values of demographic variables. And this is what we're going to call the unwanted bias, the thing that we want to mitigate. We're now going to have a quick look at impact versus treatment versus outcome of a machine learning model. So impact and treatment, those are actually concepts in the United States. And it refers to whether or not a machine learning model or just more generally a decision making process is intentionally or indirectly considering sensitive attributes. So those would be attributes like the demographic variables that we've seen. So if those sensitive attributes are considered intentionally or indirectly, that would constitute what is called disparate treatment. If, on the other hand, those attributes are not considered, yet the outcome or the process or the procedure itself disproportionately favors a certain subpopulation, well, then we would say that we exhibit disparate impact. Obviously, there are cases where we need to be a little bit careful on whether or not it makes sense to consider sensitive attributes. So, for example, for medical diagnoses, it certainly makes sense to differentiate between different subpopulations, different gender, different sex, different ethnicity, because different medication and different treatments will work differently on different subpopulations. So the one thing that I want to say on this slide is that even if we control for impact and treatment, we cannot guarantee or promise fair outcomes. So there's always going to be the unknown, the interaction of the user with the system itself or unintended use of the system itself that can eventually lead or create bias. We also need to distinguish on the granularity level of fairness. So we have here a slide on group versus individual fairness, where group fairness aims to equalize uh, impact or treatment across a group as a whole. And just to give a bit of background on the state of the science on this, there is a lot of strong theory and algorithms and practical implementations on a group level. Obviously, if we guarantee fairness at a group level and we equalize a measure of fairness that we still need to define more formally, well, then we cannot make guarantees at the individual level. Individual fairness then ensures that similar individuals are treated or impacted similarly. 
and there are strong non-statistical assumptions that prevent the practical implementation of this or at least make the practical implementation technically more hard than the group fairness measure. But then we can guarantee and this would bind at an individual level. To make some of these concepts more clear, I'm going to introduce a brief example on a credit line increase application where you have a customer and the customer is requesting for a credit line increase to the bank. The bank then, they have many customers, so they want to actually treat the request using a machine learning model. In fact, there can also be an argument made that a model itself would be less biased than potentially a human evaluator. So the bank now sends off a query to an AI system, a model, and this model now returns a score of 0.3. We generally have a threshold of 0.5 for these kind of decisions where we would round up to 1 for approved if it's above 0.5 and round down to 0 or denied if it's below 0.5. So with the credit lending score of 0.3 now, the bank would get back the score as a result and then turn it into a decision of denied for the customer. So just keep this example in mind because this would be a workflow of how does a user experience a machine learning model outcome. And this is also a classification example because the outcomes are yes or no, approved or denied. So with this in mind now, the customer, if we think about the customer, they would usually have many different attributes that we can use to describe them. So individuals, they can exhibit multiple demographic attributes at the same time. If these multiple attributes now intersect, what emerges are new subgroups. And in fact, because of what we've seen on the previous slides on disparate impact and disparate treatment, we actually cannot build separate models for different groups or different attribute groups because that would be against the law in the United States. So what we're showing on the right hand side is an example of approved and denied outcomes and one potential example of a demographic attribute which would be the marital status. And you see here there are seven positive outcomes in the married group and nine denied outcomes in the married group and then it so happens that we get the same number of approved and denied in the single group. So if we now overlay a second demographic variable, in this case here we have male and female as example, well we can obviously see that these now intersect and we would have a group of married male, married female, single male and single female. And what you can also observe now is that the outcomes are disproportionately concentrated in different subpopulations now. So by intersecting two demographic variables, and this is what leads to the name intersectional group fairness, we've actually generated now outcomes that are even more disproportionately favored and disfavored for certain subpopulations. So what we can see here is that different subgroups may actually experience additional disparity. So if you do the count here now, you would see that for the married female group, we have zero positive outcomes and six negative outcomes. So this is a purely hypothetical example. And obviously you could think about many more attributes. In fact, those attributes don't need to be binary. The reason why they're binary here is because most of the literature and research actually distinguishes on these binary attributes for male and female. But obviously you can also extend that logic and that counting to more than two groups and more than two attributes as well.